Thank you, Danny. That's a lovely song to put us in the mood and bring us closer to God. Well, Tammy sort of told you my name and a little bit about me. Uh, I'm from this area, born in Spindale years ago, moved away, came back. Uh, my wife and I have been attending here for about three years, but we came here almost 13 years ago when our first grandson was born. And uh, so when we moved back here, we were always welcome. Uh, some of you might know my wife, Miss Gail. She is uh, a little more known, male known than I am. So uh, once I was Mrs. Green's husband from Utah School, and now I'm Miss Gail's husband. Um, we've been talking the last few weeks about David. The stories that you heard last week was about David when he was a grown man and king. But today, I want to bring you back to a time when David was young and he wasn't king. There was a scene that we heard earlier when the armies of the Israelites and the Philistines were on opposite sides of the valley. And they're at a stalemate. Nothing's happening except every day Goliath comes out and chastises them and antagonizes the Israelites, daring somebody to come and have battle with him. But nobody does. And in this army is Jonathan. Jonathan is the son of the king. He's a brave soldier. He leads men into battle. But I imagine when he's standing there, he's thinking to himself as he hears all these cries and taunts, would somebody just shut this guy up? But nobody does. He looks around, his men, his soldiers, they're not quite so eager to go and fight Goliath. He turns to his father. Now his father's the king. He's a, he's a great leader. But he doesn't see his father moving forward. And Jonathan thinks, I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm a soldier, but am I good enough to fight this guy? And in that moment, he hears this voice saying, I'll go do it. I'll take care of that. And there's David. He goes without a sword. He goes without a helmet. He goes without armor. All he goes out to fight Goliath, he has five stones, he has his sling, and most important, he has faith in God. And once he's slain Goliath, Jonathan steps back and says, this is the hero that I've been looking for. Jonathan was, he was the son of the king, but he was enthralled by the action and the bravery and the faithfulness of David. He wanted him to be closer to him. So he decided he wanted to make a covenant with David. Now, the covenant is a promise. It's a guarantee. In this covenant, he said, I will try to protect you. I will look after your children if you have those. I will be bond to you, bound to him. And David did the same. They vowed to take care of each other. Now the love that Jonathan felt toward David, the Hebrew word for that is, it's an idea of loyalty, of allegiance, devotion, character, and valor. And Jonathan sees in David he sees that characteristic that he admires. He sees a calmness. When David went to fight Goliath, he didn't hesitate. He just coolly walked down and did the job that he knew he could do. And these are things that Jonathan admires. He admires him so much, he says, why don't you come into the palace and live with us? I like to, would like to have you there with me. He gives David his armor, he gives him his helmet, he gives him his sword, he gives him his bow, he gives him his robe. Uh, he, he basically says, I'm going to suit you up and you can come live with us. Now, David did prosper. David was a good leader. He was in charge of other men 
who would go out and fight in battle. And as David, as David got to be more successful, he, he caused Saul to be envious. Saul had, Saul had once been glorified and, and anointed by Samuel, but now he sees in David that David is a threat. David, David gets the praise from the people that Saul yearns for. He wants more praise and more praise, but David is getting those praises. And we've heard that that makes him angry. It makes him jealous. It makes him really go mad, in a sense. And here's a man who was once renowned and had the blessing of God, but he's moved away. He's got, he's got the madness in him. And Jonathan would listen to his father venting his anger. And he, would, he, would, he felt to himself, I have to protect David. I have sworn this covenant with him. I love my father, but I need to protect David. He feared for the life of David. He knew he had to do something. He confronts his father, and he talks with him about it. And that's the scripture that we're reading today. This is from Samuel, chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Saul spoke with his son Jonathan and with all his servants about killing David. But Saul's son Jonathan took great delight in David. Jonathan told David, My father Saul is trying to kill you. Therefore, be on guard. Tomorrow morning, stay in a secret place and hide yourself. I will go and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak to my father about you. If I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to his father Saul, saying, The king should not sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his deeds have been of good service to you. For he took his life in his hand when he attacked the Philistine. And the Lord brought great victory for all of Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against an innocent person by killing David without cause? Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan. And Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. So Jonathan called David and related all these things to him. Jonathan then brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. After this, Jonathan thought, maybe things will be better. Maybe his father would listen. Maybe his father would take solace in the fact that his son had a friend. Maybe he would change over and be a little, little calmer. David, at this point, gets a wife. He marries the daughter of Saul. Can you imagine how Jonathan felt? Great! Not only is this guy my friend, not only have I got a covenant with him, but he's my brother-in-law. He's going to live here. Maybe one day he'll have a, a child, and I'll be an uncle to, to his son. This is great for Jonathan. In the process of doing this, Jonathan has been focusing on how David is going to be king. And he's working to ensure that the future of David will be intact and that he will become king. What Jonathan is doing is he is he's trying to be an advocate for David's future by trying to persuade his father to relent in attempting to kill him. 
Jonathan wants to fulfill his covenant that he's made with David. He wants to protect him. He wants to ensure his descendants. But David's continued success, every time he wins a battle, every time the people call out, David, David, yay, all Saul hears is someone who is getting the praise that he wants. And it drives Saul over the edge. Jonathan again, again he tries to intervene. He, he tries to persuade his father. He knows his father is good in his heart somewhere, but he just doesn't see it these days. He sees his father not keep the promise that he made to seek David's death. He was torn between the love for his father and the love for David. Because David was a brother that he had wanted to have, and all the things that David did and represented, that was what Jonathan wanted to be. No matter how many times he met with David, no matter how many times he said, I'll keep talking to my father, I'll persuade him, Jonathan was trying hard, but David, David saw what was happening. David said to him, what is my sin? What have I done that your father wants me dead? There is nothing that Jonathan can really do. He keeps trying to reassure David that his father would tell him if he planned to kill him. But David knows the score. He's, he's wise to what is going on in Saul's mind. He says, your father knows of your love for me, and he will not let you know his plans because he knows you will tell me. All Jonathan can do is swear by the covenant that he has made with David. That covenant is one of true friendship based on a righteousness, a love for one another, and their shared love of God. David reaches a point where he knows he cannot stay in the palace. He cannot risk his life. David flees. He goes out into the wilderness. He takes some men with him. He wants to try to protect himself. And Jonathan's left alone there. Jonathan would have been king after his father. But as his madness takes over, I think Jonathan feels there's a, there's a rottenness in his father that he just can't live with. And there's David, his example of someone who's loyal, who's calm, who's brave, who loves God, who works hard. So as he flees in the desert, Jonathan still tries to give him comfort. He follows him into the wilderness. He probably brings food, supplies to him. And Jonathan seeks him out and saying, don't be afraid. For the hand of my father, the Saul, shall not find you. You will be king over Israel. And I, I'll be second to you. And my father knows that this is so. You can just imagine how Saul felt when he, when he heard that from his son. His son's turning against him. In their last meeting, Jonathan tells David that he knows that he'll be king over Israel. He knows he's been anointed by God. He knows he's been chosen for this role. Jonathan has kept his promise. He has shielded David from his father. He has worked hard to keep him alive. He's given him comfort. He has renewed his covenant each time he sees him, promising to take care of the next generations. And ironically, there was a time when David did reach out to one of Jonathan's descendants. Maybe Jonathan senses this last time as he leaves David that he won't see him again. He goes into battle, the battle in which he will die. And David, 
leaves to fulfill the role that God has chosen for him. I hope that David looked at the departing Jonathan and a, as a friend who had loved him because he was Jonathan's hero. There's a lament that David does after the death of Jonathan. He addresses his men after the battle. He says, Israel, how mighty have the fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very near to me, and your love for me was wonderful. Haven't we all at some time in our lives wanted a hero? When I was 13, I wanted to be Bob Mathias. Bob Mathias was a 17-year-old from California. In 1948, Bob Mathias went to the London Olympics and he won the decathlon. Decathlon is 10 events over a two-day period. The athlete has to be good at all of them. Four years later, he went back to Helsinki and won it again. First person ever to win the decathlon back to back. I wanted to be Bob Mathias. I dug holes in the yard for sawdust pits to jump. I made a high jump stand. I got an old wagon wheel and I filled it with sand for a discus. I cut down bamboo to try to make a pole for pole vaulting. I wanted to be Bob Mathias. But at 13, I was attracted to the fame of that person. I was admiring the skill and the athleticism. So where are my heroes today? I don't need to look at sports stars. I don't need to look for wealth and fame. I don't need to look for those in power. I can just look around. The very idea of a hero is to forget yourself, to surrender yourself, and ignore our desires for the good of others. A hero for God is one who follows God's will for their life. This church gives me my heroes. There are people in this church who do tasks that we may not ever see. There are people in this church who do tasks just because they show up. I see people who sacrifice their time from family in order to serve others. I see people who give of their talents to bring love to God's children. I see people who feed and clothe and give comfort to those in need. I see people who are disciples of Christ, who are choosing to do as he asks, to love one another as he has loved us. I see people who want to bring others to Christ. And those are my heroes. Look around, and you'll see the heroes that I see. Jonathan had a hero who was a brave soldier who went into battle. But besides bravery, Jonathan's hero also had a love of God. You too will see those who have a love for God, who will risk a little discomfort, when they approach those in need. You will see those who trade time to rest for time to serve. God wants us to be heroes to those in need. Let your love of God be, make you brave and make you choose to take a stand and be a hero on the side of service and of love and of hope for those in need. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.